dear friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it uh, gives me great pleasure and it's also indeed a honor for me to um, introduce to you uh, Minister Gilbert Saboya Sunye, uh, the foreign minister of the government of Andorra. Uh, this is a first in the college's history. It also indicates that the college uh, would like to uh, ensure that also the messages of slightly smaller countries are actually heard as regards the European uh, project. And uh, I would like to add also that for uh, many years the college has had a good relationship of cooperation with the government uh, of Andorra, including uh, a scholarship uh, program, which uh, has enabled, I think, quite a number of students from Andorra to actually pursue afterwards careers in Andorra or elsewhere related to, uh, to European uh, issues. Well, uh, I'm sure that uh, as uh, you, as students of the college, are well informed, um, that you know that um, uh, Andorra is a special uh, country uh, in various respects. It is, of course, a small country, but it has a very long and rich history, going back to uh, Charles the Great, at least. <laughs> There are uh, some uh, historical sources. As a historian, I always, uh, so to say, uh, like to refer to this, uh, that it might even go back further, the history. It is a country which I have been told has a very beautiful situation. So uh, colleagues who have been to Andorra always reported to me that uh, this country has many, uh, many beauties. I had not yet uh, the, um, the occasion. It is a, a country which ranks ninth in the global list in terms of GDP per capita. So it is, from this perspective, a very well-off country. It's also a relatively densely populated country. I think it's the uh, 70s in the global list as regards density of, uh, of population. And it has um, quite a few special constitutional arrangements, uh, including uh, that it uh, confers, uh, so to say, on the president of the French Republic, the rather unusual title of Prince, uh, which I think normally is not exactly in line with the French revolutionary and republican tra tradition. So this also is a very interesting, uh, uh, interesting uh, feature. And Andorra has a lot of uh, special arrangements which it has entered to with the European Union. Um, I leave it to you to judge, Minister, whether Andorra is hard half in, half out. But one thing one can clearly say is that geographically it's fully inside of the European <laughs> Union. So um, uh, from, from this perspective, we are clearly very much looking forward to uh, the uh, message you have to give to us about Andorra, change brings opportunity. Uh, your background, Minister, is that of an economist. Uh, you studied economics at the Université de, uh, de Toulouse, which sends us uh, each year also good students. <laughs> so we have this uh, link uh, as well. And uh, you, have, uh, you are now looking back to a very long and successful political career. You uh, have gone through, how shall I say, all the different phases of a political career with elections, democratic elections to parliament and uh, act activity in the legislature, uh, legislature uh, up to actually the position of foreign minister of Andorra, uh, which uh, you occupy uh, today. So from uh, this perspective um, uh, as well, uh, I think we can consider ourselves very privileged that you have actually taken out the time to come to the college and address us uh, today. You have also chosen a very nice day. We had some pretty rough weather over the last few days, so this also means uh, uh, that there is some higher support, so to say, for your <laughs> visit to the college. With that, I would like to pass on the word uh, to, um, to you. Well, thank you, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here, and uh, I appreciate uh, your warm welcome and uh, the opportunity that is given to us uh, to explain what how unique moment we are going through uh, in Andorra in, uh, in a European building perspective. Uh, we have gone through many changes.
changes already in our history. And as uh, uh, the, the director just uh, mentioned, uh, we have moved from uh, one of the most ancient countries in, in Europe. Uh, by the time that this church that you see here was built in 1278, uh, uh, the, the Bishop of Urgell and the Count of Foix, we, we were two sovereigns uh, with a dispute on the values of Andorra, agreed on a peace treaty uh, to share the sovereignty, which is uh, quite an unusual way to solve uh, uh, fights today. And uh, this idea of, of sharing this sovereignty has enabled us to go through 700 years uh, in the middle of two uh, superpowers, at least in, from our size, uh, France and Spain, and it has enabled us to go through and to be uh, a state on, on our own. And, uh, uh, and nowadays we are a, a modern country. Uh, you see our capital, which is nestled in the, in the mountains, just in the middle. And uh, this evolution, this change from uh, our origins to a, a modern country with a parliamentary, uh, rec fully recognized state and, and organization, well, this, this change is, I think, a good example of how uh, you can be respectful to your origins and uh, to your identity, but at the same time uh, uh, that you adapt to modern times. Uh, and so this idea of how to face change is a little bit what I'm going to explain to you and, and how we have uh, tried to keep this pragmatic balance between uh, be respectful to, uh, for, for your past, but at the same time adapting yourself and being able to choose your own future, uh, which is all about when we made the institutional changes in the late 90s. Uh, but before going on, and before I just sit because I have to deal with uh, uh, the management of the PC, um, uh, I, I promised the Minister of Tourism to try to convince some of you to visit us uh, in the near future. So I have to, I have to deal with this promise. Uh, uh, for those who say that politicians don't keep their promises, well, at least I will go to keep this one. So, uh, and as uh, one of our French co-princes, Napoleon, said, an image is worth a thousand words, so I will, leave, I will leave you with a bunch of images. So I hope you enjoyed this short video. Uh, pay a little bit of attention because we have embedded data. I'm an economist, so I try to profit from any opportunity. Uh, so some data that maybe help, may help you in understanding us a little bit more. And uh, uh, so I leave you with the images, but I will already warn you, you will have the thousand words either afterwards. So. Uh, uh, let's go with the video.
it's, it's true that uh, uh, first intention was to try to uh, make you come and visit us, but it's true also that uh, through this video what we wanted to explain is that very much of our GDP is based on tourism. It accounts for nearly 50% of our GDP. So uh, how important this is for us and how important also this is for the future to diversify our economy out of this uh, sector. Uh, so uh, that's why we insisted a little bit on that. Um, there, there, is, there is discussion going on now, if, uh, either if it's uh, an era of changes or a change of era. Uh, this is on the, on the newspapers quite, quite often, but the, the, the truth is that changes are here and that changes are probably happening uh, in a wider extent than ever. Uh, probably they are happening deeper than ever and probably they are happening faster than ever. And uh, when you have to uh, face the, the changes, uh, you have to decide uh, which attitude you're going to have in front of change. And uh, you can either try to deny it or ignore or try to let changes pass by uh, and try or maybe try to protect and close yourself in order to uh, have a cocoon that uh, is uh, going to enable you to go through changes without any effect. Uh, I think that is a wrong attitude. And we thought in the government when we entered office uh, five years ago that that was a wrong attitude to, to have it in, a, in front of the change. And uh, we, we opted out for having a much more uh, open uh, uh, attitude towards change. It was a lot more about acknowledging that they are happening, uh, adapting, trying to adapt to those changes and try to find the opportunities that those changes may offer to us because we, when, it, it's even maybe more the case when we are so small as we are. Maybe we can protect or isolate ourselves if we are very big and powerful, but when we are so small as we are, uh, it's very difficult to live on an isolated basis uh, in the middle of Europe. And so uh, we cannot think that we can live on the margin or, or even by the margin, to, if you let me the expression. So um, we have chosen to uh, go in a way of exploring actively uh, the changes. And, uh, when we entered into office, we tried to imagine uh, how should be Andorra in the future. And this was the whole thing about it. In fact, uh, we gathered uh, people from social democrats to center right, uh, and uh, we obtained a very large majority. And uh, in fact, we gathered around the idea of a, a reformist agenda. Uh, we had to do the things that we had been discussing about during 20 years. During 20 years, we discussed about where is the relationship uh, on Europe. Some of uh, your professors here in the Collège d'Europe has been helping us uh, in exploring how should Andorra deal with the EU? Uh, should we go to more uh, diversified tax uh, frameworks? Uh, should we go towards transparency or not? That was a discussion that lasted for 20 years. And surprisingly, or not, um, uh, it's difficult to change things uh, when things work or appear to work. And uh, the, the truth is that, uh, and the pity is that during the prosperous times that we had been living, uh, it was not the time for changing. Uh, because nobody felt that there was a need to do it. And they said, okay, when crisis is going to come, then we'll see. The, the problem is that crisis comes. And uh, uh, when it came, uh, then it was the moment to make the changes. There was no, no other way out. And uh, it's not the most comfortable, comfortable time to do the changes, and probably it, had, it, would, it could have been wiser to do it before. But, well, um, when we entered office, we tried to have this autocritical view. Uh, we tried to take conclusions out of uh, the situation, and there were two main conclusions. The first one, uh, we had been too reactive in many, many aspects. Uh, uh, probably tax haven things is uh, the most uh, popular um, aspect in which uh, we appeared. But at the same time, uh, we had to acknowledge that uh, we shouldn't stick to exceptional situations when they are not sustainable. And uh, the whole idea of uh, uh, what we have tr been trying to do in these last four years uh, was to anticipate that uh, uh, we should face uh, those changes on a more proactive way. And talking about proactiveness or proactivity, I don't know the word in English exactly, um, we, we thought that it was all about competing. Uh, the evolution of the world is about competing. And uh, we uh, stated as a mission for ourselves today to say we are going to put Andorra in a position to compete, which is not easy, uh, but uh, which is the only way out, we feel. And for this purpose, we needed a proactive approach. 
Um, proactive is kind, we use it kind of a, as an acronym. Um, to remember things that uh, are necessary to be to be explained, it's uh, it's proactiveness in the sense of not being reactive. Uh, it's proactive in the sense of uh, having a position on your own when you negotiate with the EU, for example. I will talk about that later on. It's it's uh, useful and necessary to have a position on your own on the negotiation table, but at the same time, it's it's rigor. Uh, we had been accumulating deficits and debts uh, during 20 years. And uh, for such a small state as, as ours, uh, it's very fragile. We are very fragile, and we cannot, we cannot stand a deficit and a debt spree. So it was about rigor in the budget, but also rigor in uh, another view, which is uh, commitment. It was very important to commit with the evolution for, of international standards, for example, and it was very important to deliver. Rigor is about committing and deliver. Uh, by committing, you can build some confidence. Uh, by delivering on the commitments, you earn credibility. And for us, as a small state, it was very, very necessary to be rigorous in this, in this specific sense. It's also all about openness. I already mentioned it. Uh, we had to open ourselves to the world. Uh, we cannot live on an isolated basis. And I know that it's not maybe uh, the air du temps, but it, it, it happens to be this way. And so we opened all economic legislation. I will uh, go for it. But also it's an open-minded uh, thing that uh, you need to have, because it's cultural. When you open yourself in times of crisis, it's more than only economic. And it's all a matter of alignment. It was very important that we thought that uh, every minister don't have to deal with its own business. Uh, we had uh, to have a holistic approach. And so we had to align all the domestic reforms and at the same time to align the domestic reforms what, whatever we have to do with our neighbors uh, we, in the foreign affairs ministry. And this alignment between internal and uh, external uh, uh, measures and policies was very important. And it was very important because it gives you continuity. And uh, in foreign affairs, as you, as you know, continuity is key. And uh, for continuity, it's not only a matter of uh, having a holistic approach in the government. It's also about building consensus from the government to the private sectors. And that is very important in some negotiations that we have now with the EU. And also, it's very important to have uh, teams in the administration that keep going on. Because we politicians are, will pass by. And uh, by doing some reforms, maybe quicker than we want it. Yeah. But uh, uh, it's going to happen. So, and some things must be done uh, independently from the color of the government that is in place. And so uh, we have insisted a lot in trying to create structures uh, uh, of dialogue with the society, but also structures in the administration that provides uh, this uh, continuity. And for this purpose, transversality is absolutely key. Uh, we, you cannot have uh, continuity if uh, people don't understand in the administration what you're doing as a government. And so uh, it was necessary to build teams that are working together from the several ministries that have its own identical idea of this holistic approach. And also, it has, it has to be transversal with the private sectors. You're not going to decide the future of your country by only uh, the politicians then. So uh, it was very important to build this transversality issue. And finally, uh, and talking about transversal things, uh, we chose innovation to be uh, one of the drivers for the transformation of the country. Uh, innovation uh, meant as uh, opening new sectors of activity, innovation uh, by uh, including technology as a, a transversal tool uh, to improve uh, everything from education uh, to tourism, for example. So I, I know it may sound a little bit entrepreneurial. Uh, I have a past, and I was, I was taught economy, and uh, I have a trend to, to relate everything to economy, but uh, it's meant to be like this. Uh, because when we entered office, we thought that it was really like an enterprise. Politics is really like an enterprise. And uh, uh, politics is about taking risk. Uh, because as you know, in economy, there is no return without risk. It doesn't exist. And uh, uh, when politicians fail is when they, they try not to take risks. 
that's a true failure of, of politicians. We can be wrong with what we decide, but the worst decision is not to decide anything. And so uh, we really thought that there was some entrepreneurial way of thinking that was important to introduce in, in the politics and how to manage them. So risk, in fact, is danger and opportunity. So we have to try to leverage the opportunities and to manage the dangers. That is uh, what it's all about. And in fact, we're not inventing anything. Uh, and uh, I will leave you with some uh, inspiring words uh, by Michael Porter that you all know. So it's, uh, uh, he was going to explain it better than, than myself. So here is Michael Porter. Is that actually any project or any program is just inevitably embedded in a strategy. And if we don't have a clear sense of the overall strategy, then it's pretty hard to connect a project or a program to what's going on elsewhere in the organization in, in a way that would ultimately uh, deliver value and competitive advantage. So fundamentally, strategy and project and portfolio and program management are kind of joined at the hip. And the question is, how do we ensure a very clear and powerful connection and alignment between those things. The essence of strategy is not about being the best, it's about how do we, how are we unique? How can we deliver some unique value? Strategy is essentially about competing to be unique. Strategy is kind of the holistic understanding of how the company is going to position itself in the business in order to get a sustainable, hopefully competitive advantage. And that involves all the functions and that's going to involve many actions. The kind of various pieces of the strategy actually are designed to be reinforcing, to feed off each other, to leverage each other. The final kind of key test of a strategy is continuity. What we, what we understand is about strategy is if, 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 you're, if you're zigging and zagging and shifting your positioning all the time, you'll never win. If, if, if the benefits of strategy are going to be realized, in any organization, the strategy can't be a secret. <laughs> so communicating strategy is really, really important. Yes, here we are. This is it's all about. And, uh, and uh, as I was mentioning, we're not going to invent anything from Andorra. We don't pretend to be that pretentious. Uh, but sometimes, uh, when we are so small, what is our main weakness can become a main asset. And it's, maybe it's possible to do these kind of things uh, politically in Andorra because we are small. And so uh, when I was talking about imagining what Andorra could be, uh, in fact, it's much more difficult because you don't only have to imagine, but you have to make it real. You have to make it happen. And uh, we, the whole thing is we, we, we took the idea of a concept which already existed also, which is imagineering. It was, by, it was made by Alcoa in the last century. It was the aluminum company that said, OK, I'm going to produce the things that I imagine by engineering them. And uh, it was made popular by Walt Disney. Uh, and uh, it's about this idea of we have to make things happen, not only imagine. And it's not only by having a strategy of building the right framework, the laws, the regulations, but it's also about starting some real projects that are going to make it, uh, um, to make it happen. So uh, the first thing is uh, on the strategy side or in the necessary steps that you, you need or the necessary framework that you need to develop yourself, it's about uh, the where to play thing. Uh, you have to decide on which is the, if it's a competition, which it is, uh, which is the ground for the competition, and which are the rules that you want to follow for the competition. And then you have to think on how to win. Uh, you can choose to compete globally, but it's much more difficult to, have, to, to win the competition. And this is about projects. And uh, what are the assets that you have? And what can you leverage? Or what do you lack of? And uh, so you, you, we had to manage both things because the crisis was there. So you don't have to the time for, build, for caring about the where to play without going to, for the how to win. Uh, you don't have time. And uh, um, so on, on the where to play, on the where to play uh, thing, it was very much about uh, homologation and, and level playing field. Um, you know, when, when you have to focus uh, on uh, making things possible, uh, you have to have the idea that for you, a very important thing is uh, to, pay, to play on a ground that everybody knows and understands. And when you're so small, uh, the rules that you have to follow are the ones that the others can read 
easily and faster because you have to convince people very fast now in order to get projects getting in. So uh, first of, of all, and uh, I will give you three examples. The, the first is very autocritical. I talked about the tax havens. We were one of the last countries to get out of the tax havens list uh, in 2009. Uh, and, and, and that was uh, not something to repeat. So we've been very keen on transparency issues. Uh, right now, uh, we are in the automatic exchange of information procedures. We have signed with the EU, we have signed with the OECD, uh, so we are very much uh, eager to move forward because we need it, because our financial system has to change and it has to compete and it can only compete if you are transparent. And at the same time, we moved a lot on anti-money laundering, uh, especially on Moneyval from the Council of Europe. We have gone from third to fifth round of Moneyval in only four years. Uh, we have moved uh, also on Greco, uh, on, on fight against corruption, which is a, which is a true uh, issue in, in politics. And and we have moved also in our relationship with Europe. We signed a monetary agreement in 2011, which allows Andorra to use the euro as an official currency, but also uh, obliges uh, the, the whole financial system to uh, include all the AML stuff, all the AML regulations, uh, for example, but also all the capital regulations uh, that, will be, uh, so that we have to submit to. Very much related to exchange of information, of information and tax issues is how we have dealt the tax reform. And because this is a very good example of how we have to handle the domestic side and the international side of things. Uh, for the domestic reform, uh, I mentioned that uh, we had accumulating deficits and debt for 20 years. And this is not sustainable for us. Uh, we cannot finance ourselves easily. We are too small. And uh, sometimes we talk about the, lo the loss of uh, sovereignty that we have maybe when we negotiate with the EU. But the loss of sovereignty that you have when you cannot finance yourself is much bigger. And for us, it was critical uh, in order to bring confidence to FDI, for example, to have a sound public finance. And for that purpose, we, we had to reduce some expenses, lower uh, public wages, for example, or uh, reform of the pension funds. But at the same time, we had to raise revenues. And so that we needed to improve our revenues generation by uh, introducing uh, direct taxes, which didn't exist at all. So to diversify also the kind of taxes that we collected. So we introduced, in four years, we introduced a corporate tax and implemented it. We introduced a tax on all economic activities. We also uh, changed the whole indirect system of taxes, which were based on imports on goods, and we extended on a VAT-like uh, to goods and services. And finally, in 2015, we introduced and implemented the general income tax, which uh, taxes revenues from salaries and wages and also uh, the revenues from capital. So in five years' time, we had to build a, a fully comprehensive uh, uh, system of direct taxes, which are now collecting more than 15% of our total of revenues. And, and so there, there was really a domestic issue in bringing the taxes. But at the same time, it was not only for balancing the budget thing. It was also because structurally, if we want to develop a services sector, which is the only thing that we can do in such a small country, uh, we must uh, have double tax agreements. Otherwise, all the services that we produce and we can export uh, to Spain or France or whatever are tax on origin, 24%, 34%. Nobody can compete with 34% of uh, tax on origin. It's impossible. So if we want to raise a new sector coming in, which is what we intend to do, is uh, it's about uh, having taxes just to be able to negotiate the double tax agreement. We have been able to do so. We now have a double tax agreement already in place with France and Spain, which, as you can imagine, were very demanding to us being a former tax haven uh, just between those two countries, but we have also signed with Portugal, with Luxembourg, with Liechtenstein, uh, with Malta, with the Emirates outside of the EU, and we are working on building a comprehensive network of double tax agreements that allow Andorran firms to be uh, more efficient uh, in exporting their services. And, and, and finally, um, uh, tax is going to evolve, and what we have seen in exchange of information that I was mentioning before is going to happen in the tax in the corporate tax uh, uh, matters. Uh, we have the base erosion, uh, base erosion uh, profit shifting program, BEPS, by OECD. The EU is uh, obviously very interested in devolution. And we really think that we have to move forward in being able to define best practices in terms of corporate tax, uh, rules that uh, we can commit internationally to. And it's very important that the EU also understands, as we are doing, that this is, must be a global thing. Uh, the level playing field is global or it's not level playing field. Uh, 
And uh, as uh, the evolution that has uh, taken place in exchange of information by the EU is uh, a very good example of how we can manage to do it uh, in, in the EU, EU level, something that is done at the OECD level. And the last thing in homologation is very important is the association agreement. This is our main challenge right now. We have to negotiate with the EU uh, a new framework of relationship uh, together with San Marino and, and Monaco. Uh, we are talking about an association agreement. And, and, and this is because if we want to be able to export goods, products, and services from Andorra to uh, uh, the world, uh, we need a seal. We need a, a label. Uh, we cannot go on, we think, in having autonomous regulations to adapt ourselves to what is happening in our surrounding areas. This is what we have been doing in the past, but it's, it's, it's not possible anymore. Things are, are going too fast, and who is going to be interested in giving us the seal? Why should somebody care about, in Andorra they have a new regulation on financial services, I'm going to say, okay, it's, it's a good one. It's, it's compatible to what we're doing in Europe. Who is going to care about us? So the only way out is, is by having, okay, I adopt this EU acquis, but because I adopt this EU acquis, I'm able to uh, produce my goods and products and services, and I am able to export them to the world. Otherwise, uh, it will not be possible. So as you see, this uh, homologation and level playing field has got a, a huge impact. And uh, talking about the association agreement, it's, it's all about access to the market. That is the, the second point in the strategy of being able to compete in the where to play thing. I have, I have to access to the market, otherwise I cannot compete. And access to the market in the association agreement is just this point of, okay, I, I will have access to the internal market. Obviously, for a 70,000 people country, uh, that will take probably, we have to take into account some measures to transition, to, to organize the transition uh, and, and to respect some of the particularities as we are very small. But nevertheless, the idea is if we want to compete, we have to go, we have to adopt the rules and at the same time, this is going to open us the way to be more productive and to open new sectors. And access to the markets is the other way around. We, we must think on going on, but we must let people get in. And, uh, and access to the market, we started in 2012. We opened FDI, which was very close. Uh, a foreign guy could only own 33% of a, a as a stakeholder. And this is not good for transparency. This is not good for finding good investors. So we opened FDI to 100% foreign, for foreign investments. Um, uh, we also gave all economic rights to all the residents. It was not the case before. Just to let you know, a French guy or a Spanish guy had a special treatment. He had to stay 10 years before, before he could own his own business. But uh, if he was uh, Belgian, uh, it was 20 years. Uh, and he were, if they were a liberal profession, they could not exercise after, only after 20 years of being there. Uh, so in 2012, we chose to give all, all residents the same economic rights as an Andorran guy, so there is no difference. You can uh, have your own business once you're a resident now, and you can exercise if there is reciprocity. If a Belgian architect can exercise in Andorra, but an Andorran architect should be able to exercise in, in Belgium. So we, we already chose on our own uh, to move forward this idea of opening ourselves, and that's why it was very important to do it at the beginning of uh, the first term that we had. So, uh, how once you have solved or once you have taken some measures to where to, the, to, to address the where to play uh, issue, is how you win. And uh, and as you listen to Michael Porter, the idea of being unique is very important, and uh, we are unique in many ways. Uh, Probably the first one in tourism, as you have as you have seen, uh, we have the largest uh, shopping mall, two kilometers of shops. Uh, uh, you, we have the largest uh, spa resort in the middle of the town. It's 24,000 square meters, uh, and we have the top 20 uh, ski resort in 15 minutes time, and uh, you have all these nature activities at 20 minutes time. So you know, it, that's why we, we work successfully in tourism, because we have something unique to offer. Eight million people don't come for only for shopping. It doesn't exist. So uh, this uniqueness, uh, we have many other assets, and uh, we have, uh, we have to, to, take, uh, to leverage them. For example, because of uh, living between France and Spain, and because we have an institution framework which is very unique, we have also a unique educational system. We have French public school, Spanish public school, Andorran with French and Spanish as vehicular languages. It makes us multicultural and plurilingual by definition. 
We have to improve it by having more English-speaking schools getting into Andorra, for example. This is one of the initiatives that we are, uh, we are bringing on. But that's important. It's good for business understanding, and it's good for tourism, obviously. But we have also a very efficient healthcare system. Uh, we have a very uh, good environment uh, 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 framework. So we have a good quality of life. And, uh, and it's, uh, we think that uh, if we give the uh, people the opportunity to live in Andorra, and to profit from the stability that you have seen and the absence of violence. We have no homicides for the last five years. We don't have, we have very low criminal rates. Well, all this is good for business. And we're located uh, next to Barcelona and Toulouse. So all this is an environment that should work uh, for entrepreneurs. And based on that, we, we have launched uh, three clusters uh, uh, already in 2012. The first one in education, in healthcare and wellness, the second and in innovation, in ICTs. And this is the, the three aspects that we have been working on the how to win thing. On education, the idea is to bring English-speaking schools. There are already some professional schools opening, a Swiss school from uh, hotel management and tourism management. There are initiatives now going on. The uh, Minister of Education was in Liechtenstein yesterday trying to uh, maybe think about some financial system as we have a very strong financial system, 16% of the GDP. So there are things to be done there. Uh, and we have, uh, trying, we're trying to build a brand on education. Uh, we uh, uh, chose education as a priority for for the Council of Europe Chairmanship, uh, education as a way to promote democracy and human rights. We are also members of the Global Education First Initiative at the United Nations by invitation of the Secretary General. So this is this kind of alignment thing, to, to find different ways of uh, achieving a, a brand building. Uh, in healthcare, uh, we have attracted some specialized clinics. It fits very well with tourism. Uh, so now we have dermatology clinic, we have an ophthalmology clinic, we have a aesthetic, aesthetic clinic. Uh, we now have MOUs with some famous and prestigious oncologists, uh, cardiologists, and fertility clinics uh, in, the, in the pipeline. So we are achieving to start a healthcare uh, uh, system and contents which are helping us in enhancing also our tourism, our tourism sector. So the idea is we have have to start with what we have is tourism, but if we enhance it, it also ha helps us not only in opening new sectors, but in being more competitive in the traditional ones. And finally, it's innovation. And innovation, uh, we have a, a very uh, strong weakness, which is uh, our, our dimension. Uh, and in this sense, as we have a very strong infrastructure in terms of internet, we have a, a full, uh, uh, full territory uh, fiber optic in 100 megabytes per second. So we have a very good infrastructure, and that has enabled us to attract, for example, the MIT. Uh, with the MIT, we're now working on a big data on tourism. Uh, we have 8 million tourists, 17,000 uh, visitors per, per square kilometer, or 100 visitors for, for inhabitant. And, uh, and this is an exceptional uh, environment for uh, building uh, studies on which are the patterns of consumption of our visitors, uh, uh, what do they like the most, uh, how can we target it them, be them better, how can we uh, try bus new business models in the commercial uh, for example, stand. So uh, uh, the MIT uh, is working with us uh, on this big data project and also on a mobility project, uh, uh, adding uh, car sharing, autonomous driving vehicles, and uh, electric vehicles in order to uh, try to manage the environmental uh, impact of, of tourism. So uh, uh, just to end a little bit now, because I'm a little bit too long, um, about continuity and transversality, uh, Referring, for example, to the EU situation, um, we have uh, tried to build consensus politically. So we have signed uh, a pact uh, or an agreement uh, from, uh, with three out of four par parliamentary forces that are in the parliament. Uh, we are trying to add the fourth one, which is a little bit more conservative, let's say, uh, in terms of uh, uh, EU uh, relationship. Uh, we have engaged on an intense dialogue with all the economic organizations in order to prepare uh, the referendum that 
that should take place at the end. If we don't care about uh, making people understand what we're doing with Europe, uh, it will not be a successful uh, referendum. There are fears rising up. There is a feeling that Europe doesn't work. We take for granted whatever Europe brings us positive, and we only focus probably in the negative things. And so it's very important to uh, make some efforts in trying to make our people understand why we are going this way and why, how important it is to, for us to be competitive in the, in the future. And also in, in, in building uh, teams and coming here at the Collège Europe, I thought it was a good idea to, to tell you that uh, we, we are adding profiles in our ministry uh, coming from the Collège of Europe and we, have, and we have to build this core team that is going to take place uh, to take the implementation of, uh, of all, these, all of these things. So uh, I thought it was a good idea to, to talk a little bit about it. And as politi politics is, uh, you don't always have the time to be right. Um, it's important to deliver meanwhile. And this, uh, we have uh, this quick win thing. Uh, we have to show results. Uh, and sometimes when we make these trade-offs between short-term and, and long-term, it's not easy to have results. So here are some idea of uh, how difficult it was for us to survive the recession of, from 2008 to 2012. Uh, we are back to growth. Uh, could we say that we are back to growth because of everything I said? I, I I wouldn't be that pretentious, honestly. Um, uh, because the last two years there has been a change also in the environment in Spain, etc., and that is impacting us. But at the same time, just see uh, how the FDI is impacted. FDI is 2% of GDP in equivalent. So where would we be without these uh, changes? I'm sure that we would not be uh, at least as, as, as well prepared as we are going to be. And, and the other thing is, is it, is it easy to take those decisions when you are in five years in a row recession? This is a whole question because when you take the decisions, you, you don't know that growth is going to be there in the next two years. And, and so uh, that's why it's important to, to say, okay, there are some quick wins and we have to build on them. Uh, and we have to build on them because it impacts people. Uh, you see uh, the creation of jobs and you see how hard has been the crisis for us. Um, in the budget, it's uh, uh, multiplying by six the uh, subsidies that we had to face. Uh, because you have to deal with uh, the crisis. Uh, we, it's not only about figures, it's about persons. And you see the unemployment. That we didn't know about unemployment. We had never experienced that. It was only growing and growing and growing for years. And it's a whole new bunch of policies that we had to invent and to adapt to our, to our country. And finally, uh, how we dealt with debt and, and, and deficit. You know, if, if you cannot afford your policies, they don't work. And sustainability in the finance is, is, very, is very important. And uh, you see how quickly we have gone from 12% to 40% of uh, uh, debt over GDP ratio only in six years. So imagine the fragility that, we, that you have. And imagine how quickly uh, the deterioration is coming and how uh, quickly you lose your sovereignty if you don't deal with that when you're so small as we are. And uh, as you see, uh, we have solved in some way, the deficit thing, the, the darker uh, bars of the, the deficit be, be before the payment of interest of the debt, so it's primary deficits. In fact, we are in accident in the last three years. But see how being in accident, uh, we still have deficit, total deficit uh, at about 1% of GDP, just because we have to pay the interest. And uh, the interest rates now are very low. So imagine just the impact of interest is going on it's very fragile. So you have to do all these things, uh, lower uh, public wages and everything, but you're still there. Uh, and so the efforts uh, uh, that we have to make, and, and that's why continuity is very important. Whatever the colors of the governments are, we think that continuity is very important in this effort. I would like to leave you with a, a, a thought of, which of Robert, Robert Kennedy. I didn't find the images from him. Uh, and and it's, a, it's like a drama. I only find the, uh, uh, the, sent, the, the, the statement from his brother at his uh, funeral, so it's not a very happy way to finish the. But but I thought that it was it was fair to to have uh, the the original, and uh, we really took it as a as a way of thinking, as an attitude uh, in front of life, and and also as a political statement. So I will leave you with uh, just uh, 30 seconds. Uh, it may be interesting for you. As he said many times, in many parts of this nation to those he touched and who sought to touch him. 
Some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. Well, it's about poetry a little bit, but uh, uh, it, it, I think it's a good attitude in front of changes and challenges. So, uh, well, um, uh, I just wait for your questions, and sorry for having been a little bit too long. Sorry. Oh, well, Minister, you've certainly not uh, been too long, <clears throat> and I think you have given us a lot of uh, food for thought, also what uh, courageous political action requires. I think uh, uh, your lecture has not only dealt with the challenges uh, Andorra is facing and how you have tried as government, as a minister, to respond. But there are some deeper philosophical elements also you have touched upon in terms of governmental action. Um, I think it's um, one could take out of your lecture a lot of recommendations for a lot of other governments in Europe in terms of the need for transversal action, the need for inclusive action, the need to communicate effectively strategy. But also, uh, I think uh, if, uh, that you said that there is no return without risk is a, is a very important uh, consideration. I think uh, part of the difficulties which we are facing in many of the member states of the European Union is indeed linked to the fact that uh, those in positions of responsibility have become quite risk averse uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, which then means that necessary reforms and necessary responses to challenges are not uh, enacted fast enough. So I think uh, you are setting parameters for very effective governmental action, um, and you have brought this out very well. I think also what you said about um, the debate inside of Andorra about uh, the relationship with the European Union also is a wider European theme. I think what we have in many of the member states as well is a focus on the negative things of belonging to this European construction. But one should ask, and to bring out more, the positive things. Uh, so overall, I think uh, this was a very rich intervention, which have given, and you have certainly um, will make uh, all of us reflect. But you have kindly offered to take questions as well, so I would like to... Um, I shouldn't have. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> there is already a first question over there. Over there. Okay. Uh, hello. My name is yeah. My name is Pierre. I'm studying politics here. Um, my question is regarding the free movement of person, and the EU is pushing to integrate that into the association agreement. So I was wondering, um, uh, due to the size of the country, if you, um, what are the views of the government, and what's also the feeling within the population? Thank you. Oh, we can collect and then... Yes. Yeah. So there is a second question. Thank Hello, thank you for your intervention. And um, I'm Paul, I'm from Gibraltar. And uh, forgive me <laughs> if uh, I make this question a selfish question. But I think it's nonetheless pertinent towards uh, understanding the the relationship between micro-territories, if you, if you will. Um, I just wanted to have your take on your thoughts on Gibraltar and its rights to self-determination, or if, if indeed you think it does have one. And in terms of your strategy that you've laid out, whether you've ever found any opposition or undermining of those strategies by... Uh, your neighbours, both in the south and the north, uh, for that matter. Thank you so much. Yes, and there's a question. Uh, merci. Uh, thanks for your speech and also for amazing video. Anyway, I'm also a big fan of snowboarding, so I really like to see pictures from your mountains. I really feel that I should visit your country now, so it's very good. We are going to have, anyway, in these days, I do a little bit of promotion for my country, but we have like World Cup in snowboarding, so it's kind of cooperation maybe later between Slovakia and Andorra. Also in this field, my question is going to be more political. Uh, I would like to ask you, because you said basically I understood that you, as a foreign in a first minister, you are in favor of membership in EU. But I would like to know, like, whether, like, political parties, like, through the 
all sphere there, like social democrats and liberals, all countries keep this way and they are saying also in Andorra uh, that your homeland uh, should be a part of the EU. And maybe one more specific question, I'm really wondering because I tried to search but I didn't find any information about your involvement to the current refugee crisis, whether you can uh, specify a little bit uh, if uh, Andorra also um, try to join and help uh, with this reallocation of refugees uh, in Europe. I can imagine that you are a small state, but maybe kind of contribution also from your side. Thank you. There's a question here. Yeah. 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 This was first. <laughs> Hello, I'm Eva. Thank you very much for your lecture. It was indeed very impressive seeing the efforts of Andorra to build um, a brand for itself. And my questions are, how does it feel being the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Andorra, of such a small state? And what is the leverage of uh, your country when negotiating um, with stronger actors, uh, Spain, France, the EU? Thank you. Uh, I will go for them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we have a second round of questions afterwards. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, it, it, it helps sometimes uh, for having comprehensive answers, so it helps a little bit. So, um, on, the, on the free movement of persons, uh, to start with, um, you mentioned what were the feeling of the population and, and what we, how we face it as a government. Uh, those are two different things. But when you face it as a government, you have to take into account the feelings of the population. Uh, um, you know, when, when you want to change things, you have to be able to do it. And so you have to last a little bit to be able to change things. So you have this kind of balance of uh, you have to be, uh, you have to have courage, but uh, you, ha you have to manage your, your stance. And uh, in the free circulation of persons, uh, people feel afraid. People feel afraid of invasion, of people coming and take out their jobs. It happens in Andorra as it happens in the whole Europe. And uh, you know, in the north we have uh, the Front National uh, with its speech, which is uh, a speech of fear. And, uh, and maybe in the south we have a speech for the far left, which is also a, fear, a speech of anti-everything. And it's not surprising that sometimes you have this far right and far left uh, bringing together the same fears. Uh, it's, not, it's also in history there, so it's not the first time that we see it. And so uh, uh, people, are, people are, are, are afraid of, uh, of the changes and they're afraid and this free circulation of persons, uh, for us it's very important when we want to get out uh, our, our young people, they need to go ab abroad more and more to study. And so for us, this association agreement, this freedom of persons is very important in order that they have to have the same chances that the European guys have. And uh, it's the same thing for finding work and be able to work otherwise. We, we can try to diversify our economy. And it's, it's hard to diversify an economy of 70,000 people. Uh, but we, we are able to do it probably, but we will not uh, uh, diversify as much to give the opportunity of every Andorran to find its own life in Andorra. So th this is the first thing. Obviously, it cannot be one way and not the other. <laughs> And so we have to think ways of managing this with the EU. And in the negotiation with the EU, we have already um, uh, told the EU that uh, we, ha we have to find some mechanism in order to prevent this fear and in order to organize uh, uh, this free uh, circulation of persons. Uh, we are conscious that that comes at a very delicate time. And maybe it would be easier to talk with the EU about that if we didn't have the UK thing on the table, the Brexit, etc. But well, life is like that. We, we come at this time. Uh, the president of Liechtenstein, we're talking about Liechtenstein, uh, they, they had an agreement within the EEA, which is kind of a similar thing that we intend to do, an uh, association agreement, uh, free circulation, the, four, the four freedoms, etc. Uh, they had an, a transitional period, which was uh, re-examined uh, uh, if uh, some parameters changed. This is the kind of thing that uh, we, we are uh, presenting as an alternative in the negotiations. So uh, we, we want to keep having some quotas, but I have to explain, uh, I'm sorry if I'm too long, but we are only 50% nationals in our territory. 
So that's a strong particularity. And you have to understand that through the changes that we introduced 20 years ago now in 95 in the nationality code, we've gone in 20 years from 30% to 50% of nationals because we uh, uh, gave uh, rights to all the newborn there and also to all the residents uh, after 20 years. But it, before that, it was Jus Sanguini. And we moved to Jus Soli, which is also a kind of a big change. And uh, with that, we have achieved to have more Andorran people in Andorra, 20% more in, in only 20 years. But we still have 50% of non-nationals. And we have an immigration which is coming from uh, 40,000 inhabitants 25 years ago to 70,000. So we know what immigration is about. And I will come to the migrant thing uh, right now. So this is a very strong particularity. You cannot deal with that situation the same way that you deal with somebody that has 10% uh, of non-nationals in its own territory. So we really think that uh, uh, in the free circulation of persons, there is a balance to be, to be found. Uh, in the negotiations uh, uh, that uh, probably uh, is able to, uh, to satisfy the need for homogeneity, uh, largely thinking, uh, but the need also for taking into account this uh, particularity and this very strong specificity. So we'll see if uh, Europe is uh, uh, well uh, uh, oriented in trying to understand this. We, we have the feeling that it's possible uh, because there are strong reasons uh, to, to feel so. So the migrant thing, uh, not answering the same order. Uh, the migrant thing, we, we, we had to migrate from Andorra to France and Spain for a long time because uh, you know, when I said that we had 700 years of peace, it's because we were not interesting to anybody. We have to recognize that. So we were a very poor country. So the institutional framework helps, but it's not the whole explanation. Uh, and, and Andorans had to go and work outside. So uh, we can easily understand uh, that people want to do it the other way. And at the same time, we are, most of us, sons and daughters of migrants. Uh, myself, I'm a, my father is Spanish and my mother was, is French. And uh, so I had no choice to be Andorran. That's uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the easy joke I do all the time. But, but it, it's true. And the government, most of us are sons and mig of, of migrants from one father or the mother, etc. So, uh, well, we know what immigration is. And we, we understand the fears that it generates. But uh, well, to some extent, we have the responsibility to act uh, 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 generously. Uh, we have uh, offered ourselves to welcome some uh, refugees uh, families in Andorra. Uh, uh, we did it just uh, the same week that the EU uh, announced that uh, they were also uh, starting. Uh, we thought it, it would be pretentious for us to do it before. And uh, so uh, this is kind of this uh, soft uh, power thing in another question that I will come to it. Uh, and so uh, uh, we, we offered ourselves in a, a proportional uh, basis. Uh, and it will sound modest to you because the proportion is this. Uh, we we uh, have agreed to welcome between 20 and, and 30 refugees uh, with the European institutions. Um, uh, so um, the the the. the for my Gibraltar friend uh, <laughs> who might understand better <laughs> microstates uh, positions uh, about self-determination. Well, th that's, an that's an internal thing. It will not surprise you if, as a foreign affairs minister, I stick to this uh, uh, answer, which is uh, the whole truth. And so, um, uh, but on the on the attitude of neighbors uh, uh, in front of this strategy. Uh, it's, it's very important. Uh, I, uh, sometimes our head of government says very often, uh, we are what, we, what our neighbors are letting us be uh, in our history. And this, there is some truth on that. Uh, and you, I mentioned a lot about confidence and, and credibility. And uh, gestures that we had to make in the transparency policies, for example. That, that is very important. Uh, if with your neighbors, if you establish confidence and credibility, it really helps in uh, having a dialogue about going on. You know, you know in four years, um, coming from being a tax haven for France and Spain and ending up signing a double tax agreement with France and Spain, well, that, that's kind of a, of a challenge. But it depends on your ability to build a tax framework. And it depends on your ability on uh, having uh, uh, exchange of information agreements that are, are, are uh, uh, reliable for both parts. So it's, it has been a lot about building confidence and credibility. But I have to say, and I, I recognize it, that in, in the French and Spanish governments, 
surprisingly, one from socialist and the other one on, on the right. Uh, we have had, um, uh, I think, people who have understood that we wanted to change. And uh, they have been eager uh, to get along with us in the change and to, to play the game. Uh, and, and that's something that depends on the ability of building confidence, but also depends on the eagerness of uh, your uh, uh, Spanish and French uh, responsible ministers to believe in what you do. And uh, uh, we've been fortunate to have uh, French and Spanish authorities that have really understood that we, it was necessary for us to advance with them. And so uh, I have to say that they've been uh, uh, very open. And in the relationship with the EU, it's even more the case. Uh, uh, they have been always uh, very supportive in having the mandate uh, for the EU uh, to negotiate this association agreement. Uh, as far as the association agreement is concerned, it's not about membership. Uh, it's about participating into the internal market. This is very important. It's a big difference. Uh, so it's not full membership that we are waiving, uh, but, but participation to the uh, internal market. And probably the EEA example is the best example of participation into the uh, internal market without being a uh, full member. So uh, the association agreement that we are negotiating, and it's mentioned in the mandate, uh, would we think should have similar effects than probably a similar structure as the one of the EEA. But obviously uh, times go by, uh, you cannot repeat it uh, uh, exactly, but uh, this, is the, this is the idea for the membership. And uh, um, uh, so how, how is the feeling in the, uh, in the political sphere in Andorra? Uh, we, have, uh, we have now uh, four parties with representation in the parliament. Two of them are in the social democrat, uh, let's say, area. Uh, uh, they are more pro-euro. Uh, well, maybe it's not surprising in the, as a family, European family, it's, it's probably the case. So both uh, have signed, for example, the agreement with us to go on in the negotiations. Uh, we as, a, let's say, a center party uh, are obviously promoting it. And uh, we have the liberal and more conservative party, which, which has a, it's not anti, um, but it's not, let's say, uh, very proactive in, in looking for it. And so, it's, it's never the time, or it's too wide, it's too ambitious, it's too, but it's not anti, which is a good thing. And we are really trying to convince them that uh, it's better for them to participate in the agreement to, to, to build a consensus, because they will, they will be more useful in defending their opinions inside the pact. Because if you're not in the agreement for the negotiation, it's because you don't want to negotiate. And it's impossible not to negotiate. Uh, would Andorra refuse to negotiate its future? Uh, what, what's the alternative? The status quo? And so uh, I think that uh, it's probable that they evolve a little bit, and, and there, are so, there is so, some debate publicly, because it, it was last week, uh, some debate in the uh, Liberal Conservative Party about uh, should not we add to ourselves to the agreement, which uh, we would be uh, more than happy to. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the last question, it was... Uh, Leverage, or I don't remember right now, sorry. Uh, I tried not to do it in order. Uh, yeah. What is the leverage? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I mentioned the soft power thing. I didn't remember where it was. Uh, it's soft power, uh, really soft. Huh? <laughs> uh, I mentioned it before. It's, it's about confidence and credibility. Uh, you have to generate sympathy to the guys that you're sitting with. <laughs> and uh, well, it's all, it's all about that. And you, and you have to deliver. Uh, it's about expressing commitment and delivering. And that's the only way that you can create a, a climate where they take you into account. You know, we are not in the top agenda of anything, for anybody, nearly. Uh, so that's why when the negotiations with the EU come, you have to take them because the window of opportunity is there. So you cannot say, well, it's going to come in 20 years, I'm waiting, it's, it's not going to happen. And um, uh, uh, apart from kidding a little bit, um, for us, for example, the multilateral arena is very important because it's the only place where we are in the same position. Well, let me express like this. So for us, multilateral uh, participation in multilateral forums is very, very important. In the United Nations, 
it gives, a, it gives us some leverages sometimes for supports for specific issues that then can uh, probably be interesting to uh, for us to introduce some bilateral uh, issue. Uh, well, this is how it happens uh, in the true world. Uh, so multilateral is very important, and not only for this kind of negotiation thing, but also for visibility. Uh, uh, that's why, uh, for example, in education, we try we try to build a brand on that, and we do it in the Council of Europe, and we do it, for example, now in CEGIP, in the uh, Ibero-American space. We are going to welcome the Ministerial of Education in Andorra. Uh, so we, we're, we're trying to, to use this uh, participation in multilateral forums as much as possible uh, in order to have visibility also uh, in the specific, for example, in, in education, in an environment. Uh, well, it's important for us. It's better to be there than in some non-cooperative jurisdiction list, uh, whatever. Right, thanks very much. Would you take one, of course. one or more? There was one question. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yuan. I come from China. So my question is about Andorra. Can you, uh, bear, from your speech, you barely uh, mentioned about the international relations, for example, with the relations with China, with uh, Asian countries or the others, because you are really focused on the uh, relationship with the EU. So what do you think of that? And you mentioned the, of the tourism as well as the education thing. So do you think is there any possibility that that we can have, like you, uh, Andorra can have some kind of cooperation with other countries outside EU and to find some opportunities and new windows that can open. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. There was one question. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is uh, Ibrahim. I come from Syria. I have uh, two questions. Um, the uh, the first is about the to what extent do internal political changes in your neighborhood um, impact you and how do you adapt um, uh, to changes? Um, my second question regarding the Andorran identity. Um, you mentioned the peculiar um, situation in Andorra and the relatively low percentage of nationals among the total population. How do you manage to, to preserve your identity, especially that you have um, big uh, um, uh, communities of migrants and a huge neighbor, uh, neighbors as well? Um, thank you. Um. Hello, my name is Nino. I come from the European neighborhood countries, uh, especially from Georgia. So my knowledge of Andorra is pretty limited to my best friend here, <laughs> Guillaume. Um, so I appreciate the presentation that you have delivered today. Um, actually, it's very mind-blowing that um, there are 8 million uh, tourists in your country while the population is only 70,000. Uh, my country, personally, I know that my country is trying to attract as many tourists as possible because there are um, possibilities in terms of natural and uh, other attractions. However, it somehow doesn't really work that, that well, for sure. Um, so uh, my question is, um, I have noticed that in one of the slides you have listed that you are number eight in terms of political stability. So my question is, to what extent uh, Andorra's success is based on political stability? And uh, my second question is, whether do you, uh, do you, uh, do you trans transmit or do you somehow exchange your knowledge about tourism with the countries that are trying to uh, develop the tourism se sector? Thank you. Thanks very much. And then perhaps the final question. To la voix du collège. <laughs> Bonjour, une question en français pour finir. Euh, C'est la semaine française aussi, j'en profite. Euh, je voulais vous poser la question de la participation d'Andorre aux grandes crises euh, de ce siècle et de cette, de cette année notamment. La crise des réfugiés, comment est que Andorre, quelle est la part que prend Andorre dans l'accueil des réfugiés Et je voulais aussi vous demander... Après la COP21, euh, quelle a été la position d'Andorre dans les négociations et quelle va être la contribution d'Andorre au Fonds vert pour le climat Je pense que c'est quand même assez important euh, qu'un pays qui est 29e dans euh, le PIB par euh, tête puisse prendre toute sa part euh, dans le financement de la lutte contre le, le réchauffement climatique. Merci beaucoup. Merci. 
Okay, so I will, I will, I will finish in French. <laughs> uh, for uh, the relationship with um, non-EU countries and especially Asian countries or China in particular, um, we have, we, as I mentioned before, the idea was really opening ourselves, and it was really opening ourselves to new markets, uh, if I may speak like this, and, and new opportunities arising. And that was not only EU. Obviously, uh, we had a lot of bilateral issues with France and Spain, obviously with uh, Brussels, uh, but we have tried also to open Andorra into different perspectives. First of all, Latin America. Uh, because we are members of the Francophonie, but we are also members of the Ibero-American space. And uh, this is also unique. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we, 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 really, we were really interested in, in uh, um, trying to deepen our relationship with the Latin American countries. And this is in, in tourism uh, 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 issues, uh, MOUs on tourism that I will mention afterwards, but also uh, because we have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, Barcelona and Toulouse, which are close to us, and Barcelona welcomes many, many direct flights from uh, Latin America, which is a, a good asset for, for us. Uh, but and also that, because we, we, we have, as I mentioned, we are organizing the ministerial uh, um, uh, summit uh, on education in Andorra. Uh, it should be in Colombia. Eh? Colombia is going to welcome the summit, uh, and we have reached an agreement with them. We have a very good relationship with uh, uh, President Santos and, and Minister Olguin. She came to Andorra a few years ago, and she liked it, and so we have built on that. And uh, and we, we do so because it's education. We do so because it's Latin America, but, but we do so because one of the priorities of uh, the CEGIP, the Secretariado uh, para la Iberoamérica, is uh, mobility for students and, and professors. It's uh, Alianza para la Movilidad, eh? Alliance for Mobility. And, and this, this is, it speaks to us a lot. Huh? Uh, it's openness, it's, it's going there, it's, it's having the opportunities to go there and to welcome people. Uh, and so we, we have chosen in this way also to have some initiatives uh, uh, to, to, uh, towards Latin America in the tourism, but also in this education and mobility thing. Uh, for Asia. Uh, we've been in an official visit to China two years ago with the Minister of Tourism and, and myself, uh, celebrating the 20 years of uh, diplomatic relationships. And since then, we are trying to build, uh, obviously in tourism, it's obvious. Uh, we don't have that many Chinese tourists coming in, but there are plenty of them coming to France and Spain. And we have something to offer, probably. Uh, but we, we went there to try to understand what, uh, what the Chinese people may like. Uh, when you when you want when you want to have uh, visitors from one country, you have to understand them first, uh, in order to have the best offer uh, to them. It's not the same thing welcoming Chinese visitors than Russian visitors. It's not the same thing, uh, and you have to adapt yourself. For example, uh, we we are the second largest destination for Russian uh, tourists in winter in Europe after Austria. Uh, but we, we, we have a quota for Russian-speaking workers, for example. So you have to take domestic uh, decisions to be able to uh, respond well, and maybe that's one of the uh, ideas that why we are performing well in, in tourism. So in China, we have to do that. And for example, we are, we ha we are negotiating now with uh, the Confucius uh, Institute uh, an agreement to have a, a, a particular uh, uh, installation in Andorra to, to, to learn some Chinese. It's important that our people learn some Chinese. Uh, I'm trying to give the example, Wo Shou Yidi and Han Yu. So uh, uh, I try, I try to, to give the example to our people. And so, uh, but, but it's true, it, it's, it's very important. And, and Asia is, uh, is, is very interesting also in the ex exchanging experiences on technology. Uh, somebody has asked me about that. Uh, for example, in South Korea, uh, I think that uh, there uh, with the MIT label and and, and cooperation that we have, uh, there are there are plenty of projects uh, over there in South Korea, in particular, that are very interesting. So, uh, well, the co the commitment is there, and and we we should not only stick to opening ourselves to Europe. It's uh, it's a much wider uh, perspective. Um, for um, the identity and the relationship with the neighborhood and uh, these kind of things. Um, <laughs> You, you have mentioned, I think, the, how, how to preserve the identity. And uh, identity is something that is built, is, is building on. 
So uh, the Andorran identity is not the same today than 100 years ago. And, and it will not be the same. But we have to find this balance between uh, sticking to our origins. We have to be conscious of where, where we come from. But, but, but you cannot have the identity that you had 20 years ago. So it's a matter of building identity. And to build identity, you have to change, for example, your nationality code. When I thought about change brings opportunities, it's very much about that. It's much more than maybe the economic thing that I used to use. Uh, but when you change the nationality code, you're, you're bringing elements in order to have integrating people in, in your policies. There's no discussion, for example, on nationality. Do you allow for double nationality? No, that's a huge debate. Eh? We, talk, we talked about it with the Minister of Education a few minutes ago. Uh, Maybe the good balance for a country as Andorra, because you cannot copy whatever Andorra does, because it's, everybody has its own way of thinking. But for example, it, it, it could be meaningful uh, not to allow double nationality, but at the same time to be very integrative uh, in lowering the years for applying for residence once you have an association agreement with the EU that enables Andorrans to be as European as they are in the rest. And you don't have Andorran people who have to choose the nationality of their parents and then lose the one that they had because they don't have a, a future for their life. And at the other, on the other hand, uh, the nationality is not a privilege anymore because uh, everybody has the same economic rights. So here also, I think it's a holistic approach that is needed and something that we're thinking on. I think that we should move probably on the nationality code, uh, uh, maybe by dealing with this idea of the association agreement, surprisingly, the association agreement with the EU is maybe an opportunity for us to find the right balance between having probably a non-double nationality, but uh, being more open in giving the right to get integrated. I think that's a good way maybe to focus on how those changes that we are facing may, have, may be helping us in solving one part of the identity. And the other one is, is prosperity. Uh, it's not the same to integrate uh, 30,000 guys in 20 years when you're prosperous or not. And uh, so um, uh, here uh, we, we have to really deal with being prosperous going on because otherwise uh, the, the, it, will, it will be much, much more difficult. Uh, political stability and, and security. We, we are, it's true that uh, being a, having a secure environment is key for tourism and for business in, in general. And we are lucky. And uh, it, when, when we said about this being unique, it really is like this because we are unique in the institutional framework. There is a lot of things that come from this institutional framework in the education, in, in security. So, so, so yes, it's, it's, it's uh, something that we have uh, uh, to keep going on. And it's true that when you uh, grow on tourism a lot, then you have a danger of how you deal with uh, growing and, and keeping this. And uh, I personally think that here, for example, innovation uh, has a lot of things to offer in security. Uh, then th there is a privacy thing that we have to solve. But I, I really think that innovation uh, is, is probably helping a, a lot to us. And some of the studies that we're doing with the MIT is uh, if I am able to predict the patterns of uh, movements, uh, of mobility of our visitors, depending on what happens, I'm, I'm more able to prevent uh, where should we allocate, for example, the police patrols. Uh, this is something very, very basic, but it, 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 it can work, and, and, uh, and it's, it's something that can do, we can do. Exchange on tourism, we, we are signing many MOUs. Uh, we are very much interested in learning about the others. I'm, I'm only doing on explaining today of what we're doing there, and uh, you mentioned that some recommendation. It's not what we are here to. We are here to share our experience and our view. We don't want to have any, give any lesson to anybody. We are not in a position for that. Uh, but exchanging experience is key. Uh, you know, we, we had a, a very successful firm in Andorra about dealing with the snow resorts. Uh, uh, they are now ruling uh, 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 snow resorts in Azerbaijan, in Kyrgyzstan, in Argentina, in Turkey, in France, etc. Uh, they could have chosen to keep their secret and have the best resort in Andorra and try to compete with that. 
uh, I think it's much more wiser to say, well, I, I go through the world and maybe somebody is buying my, my, my know-how. And may, maybe it's better than trying to say, everybody's going to come to ski to Andorra. It's not going to happen. So uh, I think that's, that's a good way of, of, of dressing. And we have all the interest. And, and as small as we are, we have more interest probably in, in exchanging experiences. And so we are signing MOUs, and we will be open to do that. Pour les, pour les réfugiés, j'ai essayé avant de, de répondre. Nous nous, avons, euh, nous nous sommes engagés donc à recevoir entre 20 et 30 euh, réfugiés. Euh, ça sonne évidemment très modeste, hein, mais en tout cas, c'est proportionné. Je peux vous assurer, j'ai fait les chiffres, c'est proportionnel à l'effort de la France, par exemple. Mais... Euh, <rire> euh, mais euh, je dois reconnaître aussi qu'on n'en a reçu aucun. Et c'est surprenant qu'on se propose à en recevoir 20 et on n'en reçoit aucun. Ça, 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 ça amène vraiment le débat sur la difficulté de comment on implémente même les volontés. Hein. Et, et, et je crois que là, c'est un vrai sujet euh, pour l'Union européenne et pour nous tous de savoir euh, même l'expression de ces volontés, comment est-ce qu'on les implémente dans la réalité. Et c'est vrai qu'on n'a pas trouvé les mécanismes euh, pour pouvoir euh, effectivement euh, faire face à cet accueil. Mais ce n'est pas un problème uniquement pour nous c'est un problème un peu pour l'Europe en général. Je crois que bon, euh, c'est un, un, un vrai sujet qui doit, auquel on doit trouver une solution. On ne peut pas euh, rester euh, dans l'attente et je crois que les efforts qui sont maintenant consentis euh, vont dans le, dans le bon sens. Euh, quant au changement climatique, bon, il est évident que pour un pays qui euh, vit par exemple 40% de son tourisme de l'hiver, euh, c'est un vrai sujet. On ne peut pas rester en marge mais on ne va pas le, le résoudre à nous seuls. Alors c'est un peu comme avant, euh, c'est un peu sur l'exemple qu'on peut jouer. Euh, le, le fait que nous, nous soyons, on a, ré, on a pris un engagement de réduction de 37% des émissions de, de gaz à effet de serre. C'est sur l'exemple que ça se joue, parce que notre, notre effet sur les émissions globales sera évidemment très infime. Hein. Euh, mais, mais je crois que nous sommes dans l'obligation d'être euh, des premiers à, à avoir euh, souscrit cet, cet engagement. Et, et je crois que euh, il, il faut, un peu comme je l'ai dit avant, dans l'alignement, un peu dans, toutes, dans toutes ces notions, il faut cesser de voir qu'il faut une politique environnementale du ministère de l'Environnement que nous avons, mais essayer que ça soit transversal. Et, et ça, euh, de, depuis le ministère de l'économie jusqu'au tourisme, etc., il y a euh, plein de projets qui, qui viennent s'aligner. Alors, il y a un plan de promotion sur la subvention du véhicule euh, électrique. Il y a tous les projets avec le MIT sur l'autonomous driving et, et le car sharing qui, probablement, sur l'impact du, du, de la croissance touristique sur la mobilité, peut être très, très utile. Euh, nous avons lancé des programmes d'efficience énergétique pour, le, pour le, la rénovation des, des infrastructures publiques hein, sur l'éducation ça, on a tout fait, je crois. Il nous manque encore quelques installations. Mais on essaie de, de, de subvenir aussi à, à des investissements privés. Euh, nous avons un, pro, un programme de diversification des, des sources d'énergie, euh, l'incorporation du, du gaz naturel liquide, des programmes de cogénération avec participation du privé. Donc nous, a, nous, nous sommes en train d'essayer d'engager de, des projets dans différents ministères qui soient qui aille dans le sens d'intégrer la sensibilité environnementale dans l'action et ne pas avoir un ministère de l'Environnement qui vit dans sa propre bulle. Well, thanks very much, uh, Your Excellency, for all the great patience and frankness in which you have responded to the many questions. I uh, think you have got an idea that our students can give a hard time also to our professors in terms of really a lot of pointed questions. So uh, quite clearly also uh, um, your lecture has inspired our students to raise additional uh, issues. I um, would like to add um, that it's very impressive the engagement which the government of Andorra has also taken on the international level as regards education and I would like also to mention that we have the Minister for Education, Mr. Javier Comas, here in, in the front row. Uh, so uh, congratulations on giving such uh, an importance to uh, education also in, in international and external relations of, uh, of, uh, of Andorra. 
Well, I think uh, your visit uh, has really been a very uh, special o occasion. It's the first time that we had have had the pleasure of a very senior representative on Andorra. And uh, there were a lot of, um, how shall I say, uh, interesting and innovative elements apart from the substance. I would not have thought that you would address our students partially in Chinese today. Uh, so I think... I cannot uh, resist <laughs> it. I know, I know a few words. I had to place them. <laughs> so very special indeed, also from this perspective. Many thanks again for having come and if I can now invite you to sign the Golden Book of the College. Thank you. Thank you.